a friend of mine is a big Red Hot Chili Peppers fan and uh, John Frusciante um, fan as well. And he asked if I could build him a guitar like John's uh, 60s sunburst um, weathered Strat. And well, the answer is, of course, you know, you could draw anything and, and you know, use a CNC machine and everything. You know, we're trying to replicate a Strat, you know, that's such a specific design. Um, you know, it didn't seem like something, you know, I felt like tackling right now. And so what I did get was one of these Strat kits uh, from Stu Mac. Uh, I did buy this myself. Um, and so, you know, for this project, I'm going to kind of put it together, see what it takes. And then let's see if I can make a finish that uh, simulates 60, 70 years of playing wear um, without looking tremendously ridiculous. So you can see the kit comes with, looks like everything you need uh, to build, uh, build your own strat. Looks like it, this is mahogany neck. Um, I'll have to finish the headstock myself. Um, the holes are pre-drilled. Hard work kit. The body. In this case, you know, I, I would expect that John Frusciante's Strat um, would actually be um, alder, but in this case, it looks like we, get, looks like we have a three-piece uh, mahogany body. And so uh, the first step of this is probably um, to do some grain filling. Um, but of course, there's also an instruction book as well. My first impression is that this kit seems uh, really well made. Um, as far as I can tell, there aren't any tooling marks or dents that I need to necessarily correct. Of course, if I'm going to use grain filler on this, um, you know, I can do the grain filler first and then try and you know fix any any issues I run into. On the next side, I think this is Indian laurel, which um, I've never really um, experienced as a fretboard, but you know, it seems like rosewood. Uh, the neck, you know, is already quite smooth. So yeah, overall, um, looks like this project is mostly going to be about finishing um, and, and luckily not too much about fabrication. So the first thing I'm going to do is take the pick guard off and the bridge and put them aside uh, so that I can work on doing the grain filling. Nice, the pick guard comes pre-wired. Um, that makes it pretty easy. Uses a, a vintage style um, six screw uh, bridge, and so I'll need to remove all those screws uh, to take the bridge off. So the, with the bridge removed, I think this is the first indication that this is, you know, the cheaper kit that Stu Max sells. Um, the bridge itself looks pretty flimsy. Um, you can see all sorts of pot marks or whatever those are called um, from casting. Um, so this, this bridge I'm sure works just fine, but uh, yeah, we'll see if I, if I use that or just uh, you know, replace it with something better. With all the pieces removed, um, you know, as I mentioned, it doesn't appear that there's any obvious uh, areas that need to be fixed, um, which is great. You know, having having a project like this come and then you know have dents or other things in it um, right off the bat um, wouldn't be a great you know beginner's experience. Uh, in my case, knowing that I'm going to age the finish, um, there's really nothing here that stands out to me um, that I should fix. Um, of course, when you're doing, you know, an aged finish, you actually have to do it right the first time. You can't, you can't spray it on looking old. Um, you actually need to finish it correctly and then, you know, simulate the wear. But even still, um, looks like the next step for this is to do the grain fill. I opted to get the finishing kit along with this, um, and they provide you with the wood filler. Uh, it's mahogany body. Um, it comes with mahogany grain filler. Uh, the instructions are both accurate and, and unhelpful. Uh, put enough in until you get the consistency that you want. <laughs> and so uh, I'm going to dump a little bit in here, mix it up, uh, put some water in, 
and then uh, start spreading it out on the body here, start filling the pores. The instructions seem to recommend doing three pore fills. Uh, that seems excessive to me, but I guess it really depends on how much, um, how thick you put it on in the first place. Actually smells quite good. Uh, if you've ever used uh, Timbermate, it smells like Band-Aids, but this, uh, I don't know what it is, but it smells, it smells much better than a Band-Aid. Use my high-tech finger here to, to mix this up. We kind of have a sludgy, melted ice cream consistency right now. Um, actually, probably can even mix that up more. So there's no real secret to doing this. You just put it on and uh, you let it dry. So with all that in place, I'll go wash my hand off, let this dry for a while. It's water-based, so I think it probably will dry, you know, in 20 or 30 minutes. And so once I come back, the way to tell is this will turn light brown or maybe even pinkish. Um, then I'll come back. I'll probably do a second coat. We'll see about doing a third coat. I let the first coat yesterday dry for 90 minutes. I put a second coat on, let it dry overnight. So there's no question that it's good and dry. I'm not gonna put a third coat on. As it is, when you look at this, it almost looks like the wood is covered with clay or mud. I don't think that this is a situation where um, I have any concerns that the wood pores aren't filled. And so the next step is I'm going to use my spindle sander, and my random orbital sander to hopefully sand off just enough that the wood stays smooth without undoing all the work that I've done. I'm gonna start with 220, 240 grit sandpaper. I don't wanna reshape the body in any way. Uh, I just want to start to remove the excess wood filler. And you know, if, if it turns out that that's too slow, then I'll, I'll drop down uh, a grit or two, but um, yeah, we'll see how that goes. I don't have an exact timing on how long that took, um, but I would guess that was about 45 minutes of spirited sanding. On my spindle sander and my orbital sander, I was using 220 grit, and then I came back with my uh, sanding sponge and was doing 320 grit. I could tell I was done when most of the grain filler um, stopped powdering off and got a pretty consistent color. And so it may not look like it's uh, between the original thing that I showed and this, um, but you know, there's a lot more solids built up into the pores here. We have a second opportunity for more filling um, when I do the vinyl sealer step, which will again put some, um, some more solids onto this to, to make it even smoother. Um, but for right now, I'm gonna let this sit. It's not quite nice enough outside yet to spray, uh, but once it is, uh, then we'll move on to the vinyl sealer step. I probably used about half the can of vinyl sealer here. The goal is really just to apply it smooth. You're not trying to actually finish the guitar yet. I did three coats of vinyl sealer and other than a few tiny uh, areas where there's some drips, uh, overall um, it's a nice smooth finish. And so I'm just going to lightly hit that with uh, 320 grit sandpaper to smooth out any imperfections. And then 
Uh, if I'm not mistaken, we'll be able to move on to spraying the amber lacquer. Amber lacquer is the base color of the three-tone sunburst. The point here is not to build up a ton of finish, but rather just to get the color that you're looking for. I think I sprayed two coats just to make sure um, it was good and even, um, which probably took 10 minutes total and, and barely any material out of the can. And as you can see with the back here, the combination of mahogany and the amber lacquer gives it a nice golden hue without being too yellow. The second color of the three-tone sunburst is to do black. This is admittedly the step that I had the most trouble with because the spray cans themselves don't uh, lend themselves very well to um, both having a fine mist and a very small spray area. And what I'm trying to do here is to get about a one inch strip along the entire edge of the body. You'll see a little bit later that as I try and even it out, um, the black gets uh, much closer to the center than I really would have hoped. But, um, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, it's a combination of equipment and experience. This was my first sunburst, and it does turn out very well, in my opinion. Um, but just keep this in mind if, if you're buying their sunburst finishing kit. There's not, as far as I can tell, a good way to... Um, control the black to be about an inch or all the way around um, because again the nozzle um, just sprays so much color out of it. With the back done as my practice I now move to the front and again you'll see even with this first spray um, I'll end up doing like an inch and a half or two inches of um, spray right off the bat. Again if, if anybody knows actually how to do this you know, whether you use masking or, or something to, to get a proper distance, um, you know, let me know. But, um, you know, this, the wind doesn't help here either. My technique starts getting a little bit better here. You can see um, essentially I'm spraying the can into the driveway and just moving it towards the body until it hits. Um, yeah, like I said, it's just a combination of technique and experience. Like the amber, I let the black dry for about 20 minutes. Uh, lacquer dries pretty quickly. And then I moved on to the third color in, in the burst, which is uh, cherry red. One of the great properties of using nitrocellulose lacquer is that it melts into itself, which really helps you blend the sunburst colors into one another. As the spray is hitting the um, body, it is naturally both um, you know, being diffused, but also when it hits hits the lacquer, it will start to melt into itself. I finish up um, on the back, move to the front. I'm spraying from the, the middle outwards, really trying to just um, hit the intersection of where the, the amber lacquer and the black is to give that uh, appearance of a third color. An important thing about this entire process is if you see any drips or anything else, do not touch them. Um, the lacquer will actually shrink quite a bit. And, you know, during this process, I had a few drips, especially in the black. Um, with a couple of days letting it dry, the lacquer uh, mostly evaporated off, and there were very few um, visible runs, which then I took care of um, during the, the clear spraying uh, portion. And here's what the sunburst looked like when it was drying. You can see in the bottom left corner there, the drips that I'm talking about, uh, all of those evaporated away. And then on the front, 
um, you know, again, this is still drying, so, you know, it, it looks very liquidy. Um, but yeah, in the end, um, I, I think the sunburst turned out really well. And now I'm going to move on to the clear process. The clear goes on in a similar way to the color in that you spray, you know, very lightly to just sort of mist over the area. Um, three cans of, of clear lacquer are provided with the finishing kit. This is probably somewhere in the second can. Um, again, all I did was really try and go over it very lightly in the beginning to build up a little bit of a clear um, protection to the, the color that I did. And then cans two and three just added uh, more material to the top. In the end, I think I took um, about 13 different uh, spraying sessions, you know, 13 different coats to put all the clear material on uh, over three or four days. And then I let the body sit for uh, approximately 10 days to, to off gas and, and shrink down. While the lacquer was drying, I could move on to shaping the headstock. Here I have a Fender inspired template uh, that I've created for the guitars I make from scratch. And so I'm using that um, to shape the neck that came along with the kit. And so, you know, I'm just using a pencil here, tracing it out. Then I'll go to my bandsaw and then ultimately go to the um, spindle sander to, to complete the shaping. A funny thing about this project was one weekend I was sitting around and I thought, you know, I should make my workshop bigger and add walls. Um, which meant I reorganized everything or, or everything was in a state of disorganization. And as you can see here on my bandsaw, I actually have a really large resawing blade um, that's on, on the saw. And, you know, that's great for cutting uh, very wide, thin strips of, of wood. But what it's not good for is actually doing these really tight curves. And so as I go into the, the bandsaw cut here, you can see I make a handful of cuts just to kind of nip away at the wood. I was already planning on refining the shape at the very end using my spindle sander. And so this is just as a valid a method as going and finding the blade that I needed, changing out the blade and everything else. But it's just sort of funny to me um, that in deciding on a whim to, to rebuild my workshop, uh, I actually create a lot more chaos for myself than I would have expected. The spindle sander makes quick work of removing the rough edges, um, letting me sand right up to the line. After a good two weeks or so of curing time, the guitar is ready to be assembled. Here's what it looks like, just the preliminary state. Um, I'm going to do some tasteful aging at the request of my friend to, to make this look like more of a vintage um, strat in, in the vein of, of John Frusciante. Um, but as you can see right now, I got the headstock cut. Um, the body has been um, done in a three color sunburst, though it's, you know, a bit dark uh, under these lights. Um, the pre-wired pick guard just drops right in. And uh, so, yeah, we'll end this video here. In the next video, I'll show you uh, the steps that I took to age the plastics and the metals a bit. Then we'll put this together, get a headstock decal on it, and then uh, I'll take some time to learn the Red Hot Chili Peppers tune. Thanks for watching and uh, I'll see you in the second part. Thank you.